One is design systems to handle repetitive tasks so that you're not always doing them. And the other is benign neglect. If you just didn't get to it, there are some things you're just not going to get to. And if the problem you're having is the things you're just not getting to are the most important things to move your business forward, you're better off doing those and neglecting other things and uh, annoying or, or, or angering some people because you're not doing those things, but your business is moving forward. Uh, okay, I feel like I have to sit on the psychologist's couch here for a minute. Okay, I'm, I'd like to do. I'd like to go on vacation at some point, but I can't because Sorry. I'm so yeah, exactly. I'm so my wife's been bugging me about that, and but I get so busy and I get nervous that if I go on vacation and I don't bring, you know, the laptop or cell phone or whatever, that it, I'm going to be so angst because I know when I get back, I'm not, that you need another vacation from the vacation. Yeah. How do you deal with that? I, I, I got, when you come back, that's the penalty phase. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> right. Yeah. And is it yeah. worth it, that, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. that's I mean, a great question. For your sanity, you, yeah. I know you have to. Um, let's see, okay, what I want to ask you one question here. Passion is one of the words that we often use to describe entrepreneurs. Yep. But you say that it can be a mistake to focus on that. It seems to be, let's see, it seems like being passionate would be a good thing. So what's so bad about being passionate? Yeah, n nothing bad about being passionate, but this is another one of these mythologies we have about entrepreneurs, that they're passionate about what they do. Now, if you look at successful entrepreneurs, after they've built their companies and made lots of money, they are, in fact, passionate about what they do. But if you look at when they started their company, most likely they were more interested, they were more curious, they were more yeah. wondering, they started. It's kind of like dating, you know. When you go out on your first date with somebody, not, not that there, there might be some passion there, but it's not a committed relationship, you're kind of like, yeah, I like going out with her. She was nice, I think I'd like to see her again. And entrepreneurs have that same relationship to their ideas, to their business. When you guys started your business, you didn't have this great passion for it. You're like, no, man, maybe I could try this. Maybe I could make a living doing this. I'll do it for a while before I quit my day job. That's actually very true, yeah. 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 Uh, no, yeah. my wife said that as soon as she saw me, she says, that's the guy I'm going to marry. <laughs> <laughs> you guys laugh, but it's so true. It's just true. <laughs> She still tells you that story. Huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's, still, it's still working. <laughs> tell, me, tell me a bedtime story. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, you know, so passion, it's not that passion is bad. The problem is if I've got an idea and something I'm interested in doing, but I don't take action because I'm just not passionate enough. And I think that if I'm not passionate about this idea, I shouldn't do it because there's something wrong. I should wait till I have an idea I'm really passionate about, then I won't do anything. And entrepreneurs don't think that way. They act and they learn from what they do and they build on that and over time they see if their commitment and, I, and uh, interest and passion for the idea grows and they also see if the market's interest in their idea grows. Okay. And uh, for the audience, in case you just joined us, we're in the studio here with uh, Joel Yanovitz. So Joel, I have an idea for a business I want to start. I th think I might be good at it. I don't know that I have passion for it yet, but what is the best way to start? How do you coach people on starting an entrepreneurial uh, business endeavor. Yeah, great question, great question. I suspect there's, there are probably a lot of people listening to this who are in the same boat. I, I'm thinking of doing something, I've always had this idea and I don't know how to start. The answer is figure out the simplest first step you can take to test the idea. And we think talk about smart steps, there's a couple things. One is don't worry about making progress, worry about learning. So in the first step you say, I, I don't really know who my customers would be, or I don't know which features of this service people will really value. Rather than figure that out beforehand, try something. Offer it to some people. Even if you offer it for free to friends, try this out. Or you, you mock up some products in your basement, try to sell them at a farmer's market uh, anywhere to get feedback from the market. I don't have the patience. I just come up with the idea and say, write me a check. Well, Where's my million dollars? Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. You, you, how, how many checks have you got so far? Uh, none. I guess, I guess I better start with your idea. <laughs> you've got the idea, and yeah. you've started. You've just started, and yep. you've got going. Now, here's the tough part. Okay. Everybody loves the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial success story. You came up with a great idea, you started it, and you built it into something grand. But what most people don't realize is that along the way, you tripped over yourself. You failed. Something didn't work. But the successful entrepreneurs are the ones that get past that and start again or try again or find a new way. Yep. So, so what yeah. do you say to people that are in that phase where they're like, gosh, I really gave this a shot and it just didn't work for me or I found this obstacle and I just can't seem to get past it? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And, and it's really hard to not get discouraged. I've certainly been there myself many times. Yeah, who hasn't? Right, exactly. Um, but the key is what you said is learn from it. 
So if I'm really interested in this idea, and I, and, I, and I think there's a there there, so to speak, what can I learn from the fact that my first three attempts failed? Yep. You know, uh, and if those failed, I now know something that I didn't know before. And in fact, I may know something that none of my competitors know. That's right. So how do I use that information? But how, what did Edison, how many times did he fail? Yeah. A couple thousand? Thousands before? of times. Yeah. Right. I mean, well, it's hysterical. The stories of what he actually tried to put as a filament in a light bulb. I don't remember half of them, but you, no. you, yeah. Or so whatever, whatever it was. The, Albert, excuse me, Abraham Lincoln also. How many times did he fail? Yeah, I mean, you have to fail. That's the only way that you improve on what it is that you're doing. Is, is something didn't work, and that forces you to change and find a different way to do it. And I think so many times people get caught up where they go, gosh, I'm having this difficulty or this isn't working, and they pull back or they just give up completely. And I, I think that's that's the critical juncture between a successful entrepreneur and, and one that, that goes back to work. Yeah, and so quest, here's, here's the question, here's the thing that we found really interesting is how you design those steps so that if you fail, you can keep going. Yes. How do you live to fight another day? And it turns out there's a concept called acceptable loss, which is mm. I'm gonna make this bet how do I make the bet in such a way that if I'm completely wrong, I've either preserved enough capital, enough relationship credibility, enough personal energy and pride, whatever it is, I've preserved enough that I know I can take another step. All right, we are going to co cut to our second commercial break, and here is the second trivia question. Again, the theme is raunchy movies. This one's a little easier. Sasha Cohen started starred in this 2006. All I had to do was say Sasha Cohen. You guys know that. You can't add to give away. Yeah, hold on. In this 2006 movie, as a spoof, as a spoof documentary, as a fictional journalist traveling through the United States. What was the name of the movie? Uh, we will be right back. Welcome back to The Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hunt, my co-host, and Brian Burke, my co-host. And when we cut to the second commercial break, we ask this trivia question. And again, the theme is raunchy movies. Sasha Cohen starred in this 2006 movie as a spoof documentary as a fictional journalist traveling through the United States. What was the name of the movie? Anyone? Borat. Borat, that is correct. Yes. And we were just talking off the air about how uh, at some World Olympics or something, this poor lady or girl i guess she's young girl. kazakhstan kazakhstan wins the gold medal and they don't have any music for the the um, national anthem and they play the spoof music from, from sasha Cohen from borat a oh, little embarrassing. embarrassing okay all right uh he we are going to get right into email time here and mark we received a, a client excuse me from a uh, uh, listener we received this email uh, looks like it's directed towards you how can you pay your investors eight to ten percent in today's environment Ah, good question. Well, <clears throat> it boils down to the fact that, you know, after the subprime meltdown in, uh, what, 2007, 2008, the, the banks largely stopped making loans to real estate investors. Um, and that created a huge void in, you know, in the supply of capital. And so what happened shortly after that is companies like mine, Pacific Private Money, we, we essentially said, well, look, we've got access to investors who like to earn high yields, who understand the nature of real estate and are willing to make loans secured by real estate. So um, the, the private lending market was literally you know, redeveloped uh, from what was the hard money um, industry years before and started making loans to real estate investors. Now, the, you know, the, the market essentially dictates the terms under which that, uh, you know, the price of money and private lenders essentially, you know, decided that the, the amount of interest they were willing to loan their money out was anywhere from, you know, eight to 10 to 12 percent. And entrepreneurs who were buying real estate essentially decided it, it's a business decision for them and, and for them, for the folks who buy fix and flip, for example, you know, they're, ex they're expected to make a profit on their money, so they're willing to pay, you know, as high as 12% for, for that money, generally for, for a short-term use. So that's really, you know, the bulk of the market right now for private money is for people uh, who like to buy fix and flip real estate. It's usually a, a loan term for under 12 months. And so we're in an environment where some of my investors don't want to commit to long-term investments. So they love the fact that it's a six to 12 month investment. They can make, uh, you know, anywhere from eight to 10, sometimes as high as 12, although that's a little bit more rare. And no load. Right, and it's yeah. a no load investment. And then I've got borrowers who 
know that they can make a profit. They can make anywhere from twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars average uh, profit on a, f a fix and flip if it's done correctly, and they're willing to pay um, high rates of interest for the short-term use of that money. So it's essentially it's a market that was that that has been created. Uh, in, in California and nationwide as a result of the banks pulling out of the market now. Um, I do get borrowers who say, well, how come I can't borrow money at 6 or 7 or 8 percent? And That's a darn good question. If I had access to cheaper capital, I could probably, you know, accommodate them. But really there's, you know, in, 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 the, in the grand scheme of how you assess risk, you know, generally there's, there's a price at which the people who loan, who are willing to loan their money to a perfect stranger, albeit secured by real estate, that price has, it's been coming down, but it's been holding fairly steady the last several years at around average 10 to 12 percent cost of money, and then uh, the investors then in exchange have been averaging about 8 to 10 percent that they earn. Uh, on that investment. And these investors, uh, wouldn't you say that, uh, I know it's a, it's a return versus risk ca calculation for them to loan their money out, but wouldn't you think that now with real estate prices being so far depressed that there's so little downside risk in the marketplace that this is really the safest time for those investors to be making an investment such as this? I, I agree completely. I don't think there's ever been a better time than now to make a loan, to fund a loan to a real estate investor secured by a real estate because for two things. One, you know, the air has been let out of the, the balloon. I mean, we've, we've devalued uh, in real estate in California anywhere from uh, uh, maybe 25% all the way to 80% in some markets that uh, in the Bay Area. And then number two, we're not making 80% loans. We're not making 75% loans. In fact, most of the loans we do are at a max loan to value of 65 percent of today's, of today's value, current value, yeah, not 2005 value. values, right. but today's actual purchase price, not what they think it's worth. Because I do get guys that call me and say, "If I'm buying a property at 65 cents on the dollar and you do 65 percent financing, will you make a 100 percent loan to me?" And the answer is no. We don't do it that way. It's whatever you negotiated for your purchase price. That's what the price is, and we'll loan you 65 percent of that, and we'll fund it with an individual's money. And so that's. That's uh, the safety factors and the protective equity that's available there to someone who's considering funding a, uh, a, a, a private party secured loan like that. They're, they're amazing. Let me, give you, let me give you a little personal example here that happened uh, almost 20 years ago for us. We, we thought we knew what we were doing and we sure wish we would have known you because we actually <laughs> even had a real estate attorney who was part of this transaction. And he said, "Yeah, don't worry about those IRS liens. They'll, oh, come, yeah. they'll come off." Yeah, right. And uh, and sure enough, when uh, famous you know, last words. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So when we we actually did the foreclosure, and we were the winning bidder, and uh, we figured, okay, great, this is fantastic. Well, suddenly the IRS comes in and says, "You know, uh, we think that property is worth more, and so we're not getting rid of our liens. I mean, if the property is yeah. way depressed, then they they may not have uh, done that. But we had to come up with one hundred and thirty thousand dollars in." Real in um, IRS liens, and that pretty much wiped out all the profit. Yeah, well, and yeah. not only that, uh, I know people today that have tried their hand at, at buying at the auctions because it seems so enticing. Wow, I can buy property at you know seventy cents on the dollar, seventy five cents on the dollar, only to find out that after all the work, even if they did buy it correctly and there weren't any yeah. you know un unexpected liens. You know that the amount of money that they were were making at the end really didn't justify all that work. I mean, you have to like you know you guys, uh, Brian, at Praxis, you, you've got a team, you've got a system, you you're able to get in and out of the properties. You can make the kind of profits per property that an individual is going to have a very difficult time doing if they have been right. doing it for years. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. It's a it's a business that's unlike no other. You know. <laughs> All right, we're going to cut to our third and final commercial break, and here's the trivia question. Again, the, the uh, trivia theme is raunchy movies. This 1982 movie features a group of high schoolers who seek to lose their virginity, which leads them to seek revenge on a sleazy nightclub owner and his redneck sheriff brother for harassing them. Hint, think pig. <laughs> you knew is this the, answer already, didn't is you? It, is there a movie called <laughs> Edward Brown? Yeah, no, hey, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, I'm a little concerned for you because you know these answers. These run to lose like right on the spot there. And uh, Brian, you're shaking your head no. I, you're, well, I'm you're just thinking this is a form lazy. animal question. I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> exactly. And we will be right back. Welcome back to the Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hoff and Brian Burke. And when we cut to the third 
and final commercial break, we ask this trivia question again. The theme is raunchy movies. This 1982 movie features a group of high schoolers who seek to lose their virginity, which leads them to seek revenge on a sleazy nightclub owner and his redneck sheriff brother for harassing them. Hint, think pig. And Brian's so straight-laced, he thought the movie was babe. That's not correct. <laughs> yeah, but Mark, he's seen a lot of these movies. I'm just kidding. Uh, so Mark, what is the answer? Yeah, it would be Porky's. It would be Porky's. That is correct. And we were talking off the air about uh, the movie Borat and how, uh, you know, the running of the Jews and all that with the horns. And, and actually, that stuff is really true. There were people who think that Jews have horns. That's just okay. science weird. Uh, very strange. Okay, Mark, uh, see, you have an article? Or is it Brian? You get the article. Yeah, we we both have it actually. We're we're sitting here uh, just talking about it during the break about um, you know Case Schiller and and Core Logic coming out with some interesting figures and uh, you know house prices and price to rent ratios are back to levels not seen since the 1990s and and I think we're seeing this from a practical standpoint in Northern California. We're buying a lot of property now to hold as rentals and these are single family houses and. I tell you, if you would if you would ask me five, six, seven years ago about buying single-family houses to hold as rentals in California, I would have said you were crazy. There's right. no way. There's no way that the economics of that worked at all. But now you've got these. The prices have fallen so far. In fact, up to seventy percent down in some of the markets that we've been buying it. And yet, all that all the time that that was happening, rents have either stayed level or actually climbed. So, with increasing rents and decreasing prices, this so-called price to rent ratio is actually out of whack with historical norms but into whack for lack of a better way to put it uh, with <laughs> what whack. yeah with, <laughs> right with what makes financial sense and it actually makes financial sense now to